Hi, this is Justin Cates, Director of Emergency Manager for the City of Nashville, New Hampshire, as well as a board member at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, NAPSIG. Uh, I just want to welcome you to another one of the vignettes for the virtualizing EOCs and virtualizing emergency planning. Uh, th this is a big part of uh, one of our sessions at INSPIRE. And uh, with me today is Rob Cohen. He's the Director of the Emergency Operations Center for New York City Emergency Management Department. Welcome, Rob. Thanks so much, Justin. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. Thanks for putting Absolutely. this together. So uh, I guess, you know, tell me first a little bit about um, your initial emergency operations effort when you were planning for uh, COVID-19 and, and what were some of the thoughts that were going through your head when you had to make a decision between putting people in the EOC versus looking at some sort of a technology solution to distribute them across the organization? Sure. So I think some of our initial conversations probably started, uh, I would say, like mid to late February of last year, 2020. Uh, and, you know, we, we had seen prior to that point, uh, a couple of like flight restrictions for travelers coming from different parts of the world that may have been impacted by uh, COVID-19. Um, so, you know, and we had seen some of those restrictions uh, have like direct effects on the New York City area airports and had started thinking along the lines of what we would have to do for to quarantine people basically, mm -hmm. um, which at, at that time, the concept of, you know, quarantining seemed to be, fairly austere and probably not something we would ever actually have to do, at least not large scale. History clearly has shown us uh, otherwise. <laughs> um, so I think from that lens of like, oh, you know what, we should figure out how we would run this type of operation virtually, um, like our agency's commissioner, like the head of our agency um, and the New York City mayor uh, and a number of deputy mayors were starting to think very seriously about uh, like continuity of city services virtually. Mm -hmm. And for us and our mission in the EOC, um, that included the ability to coordinate the response to basically any emergency. Um, not that all aspects of emergency response can be performed virtually and they sure. certainly can't, uh, but much of the coordination work that we started doing uh, as part of the COVID response was able uh, to be performed virtually. Uh, and there was a lot of you know learning in that process, particularly how to get as efficient and as effective and as uh, sharp and as, uh, adaptive, I guess, or adaptable, I would say, for EOC staff in particular, um, whether it's from our agency or whether it's from representatives at other agencies, city, state, or federal, uh, representatives from the private sector or from nonprofit organizations. Typically, we bring all these people together into a single uh, location, like a center, an emergency operations center. Um, so trying to build this virtually, we saw we saw the writing on the wall about, oh, how would city services move virtually? And for us, we said, ah, you know, okay, we have backup plans for, you know, conference calls virtually and a lot of work people could remote access into their uh, desktops for their agency work. Um, we have like physical backup locations. We have hardened sites, uh, both our primary and backup EOCs have all kinds of backup power and support, but running truly virtually uh, was certainly a major shift for us. Certainly. Now, I think, you know, one of the things that emergency managers from all around the country, probably all from around the globe think of is they think in New York City, uh, the emergency operations center for New York City has to be extremely robust. I think it's a pretty recent build as well. I think it's pretty advanced and technologically um, you know, state of the art. Uh, was this sort of the first event where you worked primarily virtual and, and really couldn't use that space the way that you historically have used it? I, I mean, to my knowledge, yes, it's the first, uh, I guess we moved into the building we're currently located in in 2005 and the EOC has had a couple um, tech upgrades, uh, some software, some hardware over the 15-ish years, I suppose. Um, to my knowledge, yeah, I mean, this, yeah, this is the first time we uh, attempted a centralized coordination mission without a centralized coordination center. Sure. And uh, you had mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the tools that you were using was Microsoft Teams. I'm sure there's probably a bunch of other uh, services and technology solutions you're using, but um, because you had to make this kind of new shift into complete virtual, um, 
what were some of the considerations that you had in kind of shifting those systems over so that they were the primary way that you were collaborating both internally within your organization, but also with all those other stakeholders across the city? Sure. So for, uh, for us, like our IT staff, um, you know, we used my, we rolled out Microsoft teams, they rolled out Microsoft teams uh, fairly early on in the COVID response process. I, I think they may have been, doing some initial tests on whether this could work as a, like a collaboration and workforce management tool uh, pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the early part of the COVID response, and it became clear a lot of our systems are going to have to work uh, completely virtually, uh, or at least have the capacity to work completely virtually. There may be a handful of people who, with social distancing uh, measures in place, preferred to report to the office. And I, I think that continued to be permitted as long as they met social distancing and health standards, um, but primarily a virtual operation. Um, so our, our IT staff with Microsoft Teams, we kind of saw like, oh, if this is the direction we're going uh, for the work that we are doing COVID response and ultimately the work that we're going to do as part of our non like emergency response mode mm -hmm. uh, jobs and projects, we kind of said, oh, well, let's see if we can get this tool to work for the EOC uh, as well, because this seems to be a pretty powerful tool in terms of uh, collaboration and meeting software and chat software and document sharing and editing. Um, so we figured, all right, let's give this a crack. Um, and we built, you know, through a series of trial and error, really, uh, and a couple of good exercises and trainings along the way, um, we, we built a virtual EOC that does, in fact, run. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think uh, we, we've had some collaboration with Microsoft Teams, and we've had some collaboration from our IT staff to make sure that this is running as effectively as possible. Uh, and we've been able to integrate partner agency representatives to that uh, as well. So in Teams lingo, they would be called guests, that mm -hmm. is a user who is not part of our environment. Um, and we've, you know, basically, we've given guests the right to do anything except delete a team um, so they can they can speak they can convene meetings they can join calls and chats they can upload documents they can download documents whatever uh, we tried to replicate basically whatever an EOC representative would be able to or expected to do in person but virtually uh, so I, I would give enormous credit to RIT staff for helping us kind of figure out how that's going to work and then actually implementing it with us Wow that's great. Now, uh, you know, Teams is, is one kind of component of the variety of tools that are out there. What other types of collaboration tools are you using within New York City? Are you using like online GIS? Are there any other systems that you, you use frequently to manage your EOC? Sure. Um, so our, yeah, I mean, our, our GIS team uses um, like Esri ArcGIS uh, online, and I, I believe there's a number of other applications that they use. Uh, for those purposes as well. Um, for like mass notification type purposes, uh, which also can be done virtually, uh, the city uses uh, Everbridge, which is a, like a large um, technology and notification vendor. Um, so th there's a number of other software systems uh, that we use uh, as part and parcel to our virtual EOC operation. And I guess I should note like Teams is the platform we use. It's part of, uh, I think it's part of more broadly like Microsoft's Office 365. Mm -hmm. uh, so we use that um, heavily as well for document sharing. Uh, yeah, whether that's like Word Online or Outlook 365 or whatever, um, we, we've used a lot of those. Um, and then more recently, we've used um, Tableau. Mm. And there's for a couple like other stuff. Analytics and stuff. Yeah, data analytics, visual is like data, yeah, like intake management and visualization primarily. Um, and there are a couple other, uh, there are a couple other products that our, our data team could speak to more knowledgeably um, than I could, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea for, for our virtual EOC, you know, has been, you know, like Microsoft Teams is the flagship that we use for virtual EOC operations. And then there are a number of other um, kind of more specialty softwares that we use to make sure our other missions of like mass public or agency notification uh, can continue 
um, and some of the more complex data visualization streams that pull from, uh, in some cases, legacy systems, or in other cases, via like um, an API or, or some other access point to a partner agency or organization's data. Uh, we've used um, Tableau to visualize and a number of other like data ingestion and management tools uh, for our, our situation reporting on that front too. Yeah, wow, definitely a lot, a lot of uh, gears in motion to to kind of keep all that working together. A lot now, of gears. One of the other things that we're as part of this session is not only we're looking at virtual EOCs, but also sort of a shift in virtualizing planning. Um, you know, the traditional way we develop emergency plans, mitigation plans. We normally have the people sitting in a conference room working through those uh, issues to try and create a a plan at the end. And, and now we see this opportunity to have kind of collaborative documents and those types of things. Has, has there been any consideration on the use of these tools and technologies for planning as well as response? I, I would say certainly, um, like from, from my lens in the, the EOC unit, our, and I will talk more broadly about planning too, from my lens in the EOC unit, uh, like our planning efforts have continued. Um, we continue to develop and revise EOC guidance documents and EOC readiness and planning phase documents um, specific to virtual EOCs. We were able to create uh, and release some virtual EOC guides uh, for our agency staff or for partner agency staff or partner organization staff that are coming to support us. Um, and during the, like, the crux of the COVID response, um, our commissioner uh, kind of directed a number of um, efforts and a team of people to focus on uh, what she had called like cascading impact planning. Mm -hmm. So how the city uh, would manage other incidents in the COVID environment, um, which I think, you know, from conversations with other emergency managers around the city and around the country seems to be, you know, a, a fairly common planning topic. Like how do you how do you shelter people if it's not safe to, you know, uh, put them in a, a large congregate location? Sure. Um, how do you, you know, how do you close schools or do you close schools in the winter if everybody's virtual anyway? Um, th those are two like very superficial topics, but more broadly, like how do you, how do you manage emergencies in um, the COVID era? So a lot of our planning efforts um, were able, yeah, to leverage Microsoft Teams um, or to leverage you know, Zoom or Google Chat or like any, any of these other types of collaboration softwares um, to develop uh, pretty robust planning documents. Um, and we were also able to use Microsoft Teams to kind of wrap out like the readiness, uh, the readiness phase activities that we participate in or that we lead. Um, we, we, you know, launched a couple of trainings and exercises um, mm -hmm. as well in an effort to make sure, you know, okay, we're going into the winter season. Um, let's make sure that if we had to do a large scale coordinated uh, like towing effort of vehicles blocking roads or impeding snowplow progress or emergency vehicles that are uh, stuck somewhere. Um, and there should be a large citywide need. Like typically we have a task force that uh, manages that, so a tow truck task force. Like, is this going to work virtually? It's a multi-agency, multi-vendor task force. Like, let's make sure it can work. Um, so we were able to, to launch some of those uh, efforts um, as well. So it's, it's not as, uh, traditional and in some ways it's certainly more challenging than sitting in the same room with someone yeah. uh, but being able to live edit uh, all kinds of documents and, and planning phase materials uh, we've found to be very helpful. Wow that's good that's good and I one thing I also have heard from a lot of folks that, that have done some of these interviews is the ability to use these tools day to day helps their use during an emergency. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Familiarity during day-to-day -day use uh, lends to familiarity during emergency use. Uh, and, and we found that uh, much like the other folks you have mentioned, we, we've absolutely found that to be true as well. Absolutely. Now, um, from, from your perspective, were there any significant lessons learned in, in rolling, out, um, rolling out teams or, or did any of other solutions during COVID or you know, the, I think the other important thing that you provide is a different perspective from the other uh, um, interviews that we've done is New York City deals with a lot of emergencies all the time. So um, not only were you dealing with COVID, but you were just dealing with all of the other things that occur there within the city. So any challenges in rolling out a solution like this uh, in the middle of uh, this kind of a crisis? 
Yeah. So, so I think there's a few, um, one, yeah, there's a few. So I, I think, you know, we did a, we did like a virtual EOC slash heat and coastal storm season slash COVID response update, like readiness session, mm -hmm. uh, which was basically an hour long meeting uh, on Microsoft Teams within our virtual EOC structure. So Microsoft Teams, you have a a team or teams and then channels below and then each channel can have different tabs and files and you can make other channels on the fly as you need um so on and so forth uh and we used one of those uh as the forum for our like readiness uh phase activities for that season we invited anybody in the agency um who's interested uh and of particular attention was anyone who has like an EOC response role, which is nearly everybody in the agency um, with the possible exception of maybe like our 24 seven watch center or field responder uh, personnel who, who do very much have uh, EOC roles. Those are primarily coordinated by our watch center though. Um, so basically anybody in the agency who was interested uh, and we did like a screen share and some talking points and we launched our virtual EOC guide and our virtual agency handbook uh, for agency representatives coming to the EOC. Uh, and you know, we actually did this in the team that we would use when there was uh, an emergency. So we got people familiar with, oh, you know, here's my ESF's channel. I see it right mm -hmm. there. Oh, situation reporting. There's a channel for that. Great. I bet the situation report templates in there. Um, general updates. Oh, I bet I go here for general incident updates that may be more urgent than a situation report. Um, and we kind of went through with talking points on each of these and had everybody in the EOC uh, participate. So I would say, you know, for for someone looking to do a virtual EOC orientation, um, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good way to do that. Um, and my, my units team and I uh, kind of developed that for our agency and, and were able to launch it um, pretty successfully. So that's, that's certainly a, you know, a success point, I would say. Um, we learned through responding to a number of different emergencies uh, in the virtual EOC, COVID obviously being the largest one, um, a number of heat waves, a number of power outages, tropical storm ECEAS, which impacted us earlier on in the season, tropical storm Fay, which very briefly impacted the city, um, a number of winter storms, uh, a number of ice storms, some other power outages. Um, it never ends for you guys. It never ends. Never. It's a big city. It never ends. Uh, and I think you know a lot of that, with a lot of those activations, um, comes lessons learned. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, just today, we you know we're offering some comments on a winter weather uh, virtual EOC activation after action report. Um, so some of this stuff is particularly fresh in my mind because we got to see a draft of some of that stuff today, which is useful. Um, We've seen challenges in transitioning across different shifts, uh, which I, I think is, you know, in hindsight, it's not a surprise. If we're used to doing like one-to-one face-to-face -to -face transitions with the person who's relieving you, or if your shift is about to end, you're used to like meeting someone at your desk in the yeah. EOC and like doing a transition briefing with them. They ask you questions, you give them answers, you ask them questions, they give you answers, and you kind of help them like keep the ship on its course, or if you're trying to adjust it, adjust it to a new course, and that conversation's done in person. And then there's like an operational period briefing that happens shortly thereafter for everybody involved in that shift and for that shifts, uh, like EOC leadership to to lead that briefing and help set the, uh, the direction for the shift. Um, and it was challenging to do that virtually, uh, as we have learned, uh, and have looked to correct uh, correct might be too harsh a word. We've looked to improve the way that we do sure. uh, transitions in the virtual EOC. So we have some guidance. Um, we have a template, of course, subject to change, but better than nothing, uh, template for like a timeline um, of like, okay, you know, your shift ends in 60 minutes. Here's what you should start thinking about. Okay, your shift ends in 30 minutes. Here's what you should have on the calendar. Okay, your shift ends now. Okay, your shift is you know now half an hour over. The new person's come in, um, and we socialize that widely across our on-call teams. Um, and some of that is like content specific, um, if, you know, not anything super unique from what you would normally transition in person. Uh, your you know current or planned actions, objectives for your. Uh, the objectives of the incident as they pertain to your agency's ESF, any outstanding resource requests, um, 
sticky problems that are not resolved, whatever. Uh, and we want to make sure that those are communicated virtually uh, as well. It, it's not that our EOC staff don't know or aren't comfortable with what it is that they're supposed to do at a transition. The, the opposite's the truth. They're very strong at doing this. Uh, an added challenge is doing this virtually. Sure. Um, so we've tried to standardize uh, with, with some success and some growing success and some growing pains, but some growing success. We've tried to standardize like, okay, you know, do your ESF transition uh, or section transition at this time. Uh, and then, you know, 30 minutes after that is the actual end of shift. So if you run a little late, that's fine. And then like within the first 30 minutes is the emergency management agency staff, we would sarcastically, we call it like a huddle, um, mm -hmm. which would be, you know, in person, it's the group at 15 or 20 or 30 of us on for the shift uh, sitting together and then doing like a multi-agency room wide 50 or 100 people there uh, briefing of what's happening for that shift. Uh, we've tried to do the same using Microsoft Teams uh, as our virtual EOC platform. Uh, and we, we've had to adjust some of our templates and some of our schedules uh, to be really, really specific about what's supposed to happen and when. Um, and I'd say we're still getting better on that front. Um, but I, I would flag, yeah, like end of tour, beginning of tour transitions as being uh, initially particularly challenging virtually. Yeah, no, I, and, and even uh, in a smaller agency like ours, or certainly we're, we're not a New York City, but we do have, you know, a need for 24-hour operations in our of EOC. Course. And, and um, one of the things we found was the virtual EOC worked really well um, just automatically for those asynchronous types of communications that take place within the EOC, you know, through the chats or through the document sharing and, and that kind of stuff. But um, the biggest challenge, I think the biggest uh, opportunity for people to learn was how to do those synchronous types of activities, like the briefings and the one-on-ones with, with folks. Um, and so it sounds like even, you know, in a large agency, uh, you, you've seen some of the same types of issues and they've worked to come up with solutions to resolve some of them. Yeah, and I guess on that, uh, one other item I might point out, um, so we've used, we've called it like an open line. Um, it's basically a meeting mm -hmm. uh, that happens in our virtual EOC, Microsoft Teams is like a general channel. We like turn on a meeting on the general channel uh, at the start of the incident and leave it going until the end of the incident. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, transition on, transition off, whatever, but that link stays the same. And whatever team is on is monitoring that. When they have to duck off for a different conference call, they do so. They're doing live document edits. They duck off, totally fine. But everybody comes back on. Uh, mm -hmm. And all our like the synchronized meetings all happen on that uh, on that channel on the open line or this meeting we set up in Teams and leave running for the activation. Uh, and and we found that to be helpful uh, mm -hmm. as well. It's you know it's not. The same thing as having everybody in the room, uh, but it's having everybody literally in the same virtual room. So when you, you know, take your microphone off mute um, and say, you know, hey, is there anybody from the fire department on? We have a question uh, about a multi-car accident on the Henry Hudson Bridge. Uh, like the answer is yes, wow. they're there. You're not running around trying to find them. Uh, it's like, you know, yeah, FDOC is on the open line. It's like, oh, Great, you know, thanks. Uh, so we can point to that as a success story as well. Sometimes it takes a little shepherding to get people into the right place. It's not as easy as walking into the same room, uh, but that's you know that's part of the responsibility uh, for us. And then we've we found some success with that. It's in the activation team. It's a meeting everybody's on unless they have to jump off to a different one. And then once whatever your other call a meeting is ends, you come back onto this open line. Sure. No, that's a great idea. That's really great. So tell me a little bit about- I credit for the idea. Yeah. You can take credit for the implementation, but not the idea. <laughs> tell me a little bit about some of the processes that you used, uh, you know, whether it be Microsoft Teams or any of the other virtual tools um, in the EOC, you know, things like resource management, uh, situation reporting. What, what types of activities were you engaged with virtually over, you know, the last couple of, of uh, months? 
So the, the two you outlined right away have been uh, really big ones for us. Um, situation reporting, you know, we would upload a copy of our situation report template uh, in Microsoft Teams as a Word document. Um, some elements that are table-based are Excel, um, some elements that are long or have like data pipelines that would go through Tableau, for example. Um, we've, you know, we've done, I guess, a, basically a copy and print into PowerPoint or PDF or something to make them easy to distribute to anybody, even those who don't have access to Tableau, sure. um, which for many of our partner agencies or for uh, folks in the mayor's office or at city hall, uh, like elected officials or appointed official levels, um, getting a, a PDF to them at a predictable time every day has been uh, critical instead of having you know them get access to Tableau and uh, navigate through it. It's been easier for uh, for their purposes, and it's been comparably easy for our purposes to use uh, tools that everybody knows how to use, I would say. Um, so, th you know, in, in, in that case, we've found some success with Teams. I mean, if you're even at all familiar with Microsoft Word, you can do Microsoft Word in Teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for our purposes, we have like a situation reporting channel uh, within the virtual EOC. Uh, so you're, you're still in the virtual EOC, you're still on the open line, uh, and you know situation reports are due at 1,630 hours. Uh, maybe we even offered a reminder on the open line to mm -hmm. submit them by 1,630 hours. Uh, and then you go to the situation reporting tab, and it's like a live edit uh, collaborative document, and you can see your fellow ESF mm -hmm. coordinators and uh, agency representatives putting their information into it. Uh, our planning section team would upload that document uh, based on an EOC unit uh, template, which we may edit on the fly in consultation with the on-call teams planning section and leadership. Um, so yes, yeah, situation reporting through the live document uh, editing features, absolutely. Um, getting these reviewed we found to be easy in a sense um by using like the the screen share so you know our planning team basically our planning section would do like a screen share with the eoc uh manager or uh whoever the on-call executive is for that tour uh, and like sit down with them for half an hour literally screen share through the sit rep yes good okay uh and the approval process uh has has never been faster. I mean, arguably yeah. it's faster than in person uh, because in that case, you'll have edits coming in from multiple copies. And in this case, it's like one document that everybody can see and edit and comment on at the exact same time. Um, so that's been very helpful. Uh, our logistics team uh, uses a software called DLAN. Um, I, to be honest with you, I forget what it stands for, uh, but it's a resource management software tool uh, that's uh, big in, certainly big in New York State. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's what New York State Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services uses as well. So our colleagues at State OEM use that. Uh, and, and we make sure that agency reps or ESF coordinators uh, or other activated personnel uh, know how to use that or know how to get directly in contact with the logistics section uh, who can um, then use that as well. Um, and I, I think I forgot to mention that software earlier. Um, so yeah, DLAN we've used as our resource management software uh, virtually, you can access it online. Interesting. Very, and I'm, I'm guessing, I think I've heard of DLAN a number of times before. It's very similar to some of the other uh, like emergency management types of solutions that are out there. It's, it's more focused toward, right. unlike Teams or Zoom or something, you know, which is really um, you know, used by a number of different industries. Um, now, you had mentioned, I think, the example of the um, being able to review the situation report and get approvals is, is actually much more efficient uh, than it's ever been before. Were there any other examples of sort of this virtual operations that you were able to do things even better than you would be able to do them in person in your EOC? Might even be, you know, uh, I'll give you another potential example is uh, you've got now this ability to maybe interact with, um, you know, people, stakeholders that are engaged with your emergency operations that, you know, physically can't fit into your EOC. Is, was there more people able to kind of be a part of the response process than would normally be there within the room? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, there's certainly, yeah, there's certainly more folks that we can access um, quickly. And I think someday when we're back in the room, like we don't, those pieces of the virtual EOC that have been very successful 
uh, we don't see those ending. Like if the way to do a situation report is to use teams and do it collaboratively, whether you're in the same room, whether you're in different rooms, like we'll, we'll use it, we'll do it. Um, if this open line thing makes sense, even if you're in a room together, but maybe there's another operation center that's trying to patch into your operation center, like we'll keep it up and running with that. That's a success story and, and we'll run with it. Um, and I think, so yeah, I, I mean, in that sense, I would say yes. And maybe I would say like, the ability to get more specific and kind of unusual expertise is easier. Like we're, we're probably, we're probably not going to get uh, like the a senior officer at the end or captain, lieutenant, sergeant, inspector, whatever um, of the NYPD's traffic management team, like in our EOC. Mm -hmm. um, we have had success in getting them on our open line. We're yeah. probably not going to get like a fire department operations center representative in our building. We have had success in getting them virtually. Um, some of our like state or federal partners that may not even be located in New York City, uh, mm -hmm. although they have representatives in New York City, sure. Um, I, I think we've seen some success with that. So folks that you would get on a conference call uh, you know, a daily city, state, federal check-in call or something like that. Um, if you need them as part of a broader group, not just like a one-off to your point earlier, not just like an asynchronous conversation with them, but like, oh, you know what, we're going to do this call again at 11 a.m. Uh, and now we can put a lot more people on this call than we could before. Uh, yeah. Even if, you know, we, our IT staff helps us to manage that and people understand, you know, who's supposed to report out and when questions are appropriate and whatever else. Um, so I would say, yeah, I think the ability to get uh, highly technical expertise uh, is arguably easier. Um, I think you could counter argue that you're sitting in the EOC, you could pick up the phone and call them, sure. uh, but it's, it's easier to get more, in which case you're the only person that can hear them. It's easier to get more people uh, to hear technical expertise virtually than it has been virtually simultaneously than it has been to do so in person. Interesting. That's good. Um, so you mentioned a couple of processes that you're using virtual EOCs for. So resource management, situation reporting, those types of things. Were there any unique um, operations that your EOC had to engage with during COVID or, or any one of the other emergencies that you've dealt with over the past year? Uh, that required you to sort of set up a new process or feature within Teams on the fly? And, and how easy was it to configure? Sure. Um, so the the live edit sit rep and the open line were both like that. It was like, oh, cool. We can turn on a meeting in a channel and give anybody the link. We get to control who gets the link, but give anybody the link and then they're in. Like, mm -hmm. sweet. This is a lot easier than doing something in person would be. Um, We've built some channels on the fly. Putting the situation report in a separate channel uh, was a strategy that's worked really well for us. Um, if we kind of saw like a really, really crowded, uh, like general channel where we put the open line um, and we were like, you know, how did people for sit rep updates? And it was one of tens or dozens or hundreds of up, like that's a little challenging, but by packaging like, oh, all things situation reporting go here. That was certainly a success story for us on the fly. Um, some of our task forces have been successful on the fly as well. Um, I, maybe this is an inverse example. Our very, my very first crack uh, at the virtual EOC uh, was like, was too big. The scenario was like a heat wave and power outage. And I figured out oh, cool, like every ESF, every task force agencies, field operations, like we, we have this thing, let's build it. Um, and that became that became a little difficult to manage um, and certainly difficult to use. Like we had folks who were like, wait a second, I see a planning section channel, I see an open line, I see a general channel, I see a situation reporting channel. I'm an ESF coordinator and I have two task forces that are in coordination with me and I see these on three separate channels. Uh, like what, where am I supposed to go? Uh, so our, our mindset shift a little bit from mm -hmm build to the worst and then people only use what they need like that that became uh unsustainable and very confusing so instead we figured no like build to the emergency you're managing and if it needs to grow grow yes. uh, like i think it's the virtual 
it's the virtual equivalent of uh, like managing a problem at the lowest level possible, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. which took us a little while to figure out. I think initially we figured out, oh, you know, let's, if we might need a hundred seats for this thing, let's put in a hundred seats. Uh, but in fact, yeah, seats and processes, I guess, are uh, in hindsight, very clearly different. Um, so our initial exercise, by the time we finally finished explaining to people what the channel structure was, it was like the exercise time was three quarters over. Yeah. And we figured, ah, like we, we don't want to spend the first 45 minutes of an activation trying to orient people to the dozens and dozens of channels that we've made. Like we got to build this easier and then grow from it, uh, or if we don't need it, we just turn it back off, but grow from it. Um, so I, I would point, yeah, I would point to that as maybe an inverse example of your question of like, what's something you've built on the fly? We learned on the fly, like the best way to manage this is to build on the fly. It's not to build something big and hope they figure it out. Yeah, no, that's a great point. We saw the same exact thing. And that was, that was our model as well. We just, you know, if, if, if it seemed like there was a problem uh, group that was kind of forming, we would set up a channel for them, you know, as, as we realized it became something that they needed to work on. So yeah, we right. saw a similar situation there. Now, um, actually, I have one other really quick, really quick point. I'm sorry on this that I just remembered too. So like our partner agencies are included on our team as like guests. Mm -hmm. um, and we built a survey tool on the fly. So it's basically like, I think it's powered by Excel um, and may or uh, Microsoft Forms, which spits out a spreadsheet that looks like mm -hmm. an Excel sheet. Um, and we're tinkering around with a couple other Microsoft tools, Power Automate being one that may be able to do this automatically for us. Um, but for now, when we activate the virtual EOC and we want representatives from agencies that are not our own agency, we send a link to this survey uh, and it's like, hey, you know, please indicate your name, your agency, your email, your phone, what shift you are and click submit. Uh, and then we in the planning section or as ESF coordinators or our IT staff like get this basically an access request spreadsheet. So instead of some people calling an ESF coordinator, some people emailing a planning section joint account, uh, some people calling our watch center trying to figure out how to get in. We have this, you know, like click here for access link basically. Sure. Uh, and then we go through and grant access to anybody that we need. And we found that to be uh, useful. We found that to be useful. That's a great that was, idea. That was built on the fly. Yeah, that was like, oh, let's get a survey in the virtual EOC with a link that can go out of the virtual EOC so that we can get this, you know, streamlined. That's great. Now, um, it sounds like you built out a lot. You were able to see a lot of successes. Um, you know, looking back at the last year worth of response in this virtual EOC environment, are there any features or capabilities that you wish you had that maybe don't exist now or that um, you just didn't have time to, to create? I think one, you know, as basic it is like a really easy way to take attendance. Like when you're sitting in the same room, it's like, I can see who's here because I can see around the room. I can see who's at their desk. I can see, okay, fire, DOT, police, Red Cross, whatever. Um, it's it's much harder to do that in the virtual EOC. Like it's, it's like Zoom or anything else. It's like toggling through a couple different screens <laughs> to see. Um, so we've like, we've built a sign-in sheet that's like mm -hmm. a live document that people are supposed to go and sign into. And when they do, that's great. Uh, but again, you know, it's shepherding people into a new process. And if they're not super familiar with Microsoft Teams, it's kind of like, you know, okay, go to the general tab or go to the general channel, click files on the tab at the top, pick the sign-in sheet and then enter your information there. It's basically a shared Excel sheet. Um, so it's like a couple extra steps. There's no the survey tool that we used says who's scheduled to be there. There's no automatic tool that's like bing so-and-so at fdny.nyc.gov has just joined. Like we haven't seen a functionality like that, but that'd be great. Um, so that that's a really simple one. And I think, you know, getting a, like getting a virtual platform that is uh, collaborative, we have getting one that's like can pull niche systems together, maybe like not quite so much. Um, like it, we've had tremendous success with Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams was not designed as an incident management system. It was designed as like a 
basically an office collaboration system yep. from my understanding. Yep. Um, so some of these bits and pieces like sit rep visualization, um, ingestion of, I don't know, 311 information complaints or mm -hmm. the sanitation department's plow tracker or National Weather Service data sets and a radar map and snowfall uh, predictions and actuals as measured at Central Park, JFK, LaGuardia, like all the information that we typically look for, um, mass transit disruptions or suspensions from lots of different sites around the city, uh, like that process where you're, we're still doing, um, there's no, there's no like unified different agencies, different organizations, uh, system, I would say that, that we've been able to build and integrate to our virtual EOC. Like there, there are a couple separate, all very powerful and all easy to use. And, you know, if you have two monitors, you just run a couple different tabs and you're totally fine. Um, but it would be cool to have like one collaborative incident management system slash data management situational awareness system. No, it makes sense. And I, I think your your thoughts about, you know, connecting some of these um, non-traditional um, platforms that, you know, that Microsoft Teams or Microsoft Office 360, they're not thinking about trying to find ways to add these types of things because it's not their core business environment, but right. um, definitely something for emergency managers that we're looking for. So yeah. to kind of close this out, um, maybe just kind of give me your overview of, of, of what you think the future of, of virtual EOCs looks like and you know, what do you think the opportunities are moving forward for, for New York City emergency management on how you'll use systems like this um, as we progress into the future? Sure. So I think um, we've started some of these conversations internally recently as like maybe the, the other side to the in-person like building repopulation uh, mm -hmm. planning that we've done basically or that we're starting to do. Um, like I... I think it stays. I mean, we've had some conversations. None of this is final. Like we've had some conversations that were, uh, yeah, we've had some conversations that were as plain as like, we should add a new level. Like we have four activation levels, we should add a fifth. And the fifth would be, you know, the new level three would be virtual. And then level two is in-person interagency. Right? Um, and then there was some pushback that was like, well, maybe virtual is a caveat for each of these. And it's like level four, three, two, or one, or four V, three V, two V, one V. Uh, and maybe there's some folks who are in person and some folks who are not in person. That was our model for Tropical Stormy CES. I mean, it, we would, yeah, we would like, you can't virtually remove a tree. Like somebody has to actually go remove the tree. And the mm -hmm. coordination centers for these like very field forward debris management, for example, operations, um, or other infrastructure or, or utility outages or whatever, like that's done in person. Um, so I, I think for us, I think our next step is like figuring out what a reasonable hybrid in-person virtual model is uh, and how we get that to, um, like how we get that to stick. Uh, and I think for, yeah, like I, I think generally um, getting, I don't know if standardization is the right word because there's a lot of you know specific systems that different agencies and organizations need to use. Fine, um, I think interoperability is probably the right word as opposed to like everybody's using the same system as opposed to everybody's using the system that's right for them and these systems can connect to each other. Uh, like I think that makes more sense. Um, and you know we found Teams to be fairly user-friendly. If you can use in Microsoft anything, you can use it in Teams. Um, and I think we want to build on that capability some more, uh, whether that's a situational awareness tool within Teams uh, or situational awareness tools that can communicate to Teams. Um, that would be, uh, that'd be really successful. Um, the, yeah, I know we're about to wrap up, so I'll keep my last thought you know, clear. But like in the EOC, another, we have not found a situational awareness display uh, that works as well virtually as it does in the EOC. Like in the EOC, we have screens all over the place. There's a microphone in the center of the room. Um, the open line might be that microphone, but like there's no, there's no like heads up display or, or dashboard functionality that we've been able to build yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that would be uh, tremendously useful and something that, you know, 
someone at home on their Teams app could see, and someone in the building could see, and someone at the you know Downtree Task Force Coordination you know forward post or whatever at Prospect Park in Brooklyn can pick this up and see the same thing. Um, I think that would be, I think that'd be really uh, really useful. Yeah, uh, it's some some interesting ideas and uh, the potential for virtual uses in the future is definitely going to be it's going to be interesting to see you know what we end up doing. But uh, I'm sure many of the many of the successes that we've seen over the last year will probably continue to move forward and, and hopefully we can continue to improve on them. Rob, uh, I want to thank you for you know, taking some time to speak to the Inspire folks. Um, I also wanted to let everybody know that Rob is, is going to put together some, some resources uh, that you know, they've collected and, and put together at New York City that might be helpful to other emergency managers who are looking to go down this route. Um, that's the whole key is to try and learn uh, the best practices from uh, organizations like New York City who have learned the lessons and, and, and are moving forward with them. Thanks again, Rob. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we, we learned too. Some of the things that we've introduced were like, oh, cool. Uh, you know, that's, that's great. Uh, and, you know, yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're happy to share, obviously. And we also like learning what other organizations do and adopting that and getting it to work here. Um, yeah, thanks for putting this together. I think, uh, I think this will be a very exciting opportunity to connect virtually. Absolutely. Thanks again, Rob.